by um, popular demand, Titch Cartwright's back. Um, and I know we're supposed to be, we're talking about a serious subject, but um, as we discussed last time, uh, always good to find a reason to laugh. And, uh, and Titch has never found wanting uh, when it comes to seeing the, the humorous side of things. Um, Titch, I'm pleased you've upped your game a little. I don't think any sergeant major would actually give you any points for, for your turnout, but you've made a little bit of an a little bit of an effort. Well done. Just tell us about what you're wearing. And this, this is our, our mess outfit, and it always amazed me why we had to dress up so smartly to go to a party to drink too much. We could have gone in our in our t-shirts and would have been just the same. But just to inform you, I also brought my sword along to show you because in our day, these swords are Wilkinson swords and they have the Queen's crest on the front and later they became German ones. I just thought I'd add a bit of atmosphere. May I remove my jacket now, please? <laughs> you, you may, you may, but thanks. Thanks for making me. Thank you very much. Titch, um, not picking up where we left off, actually going back a bit. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a time that I also remember because I was also in the RLI at the time and word came through about um, the fact that there'd been a coup in Portugal and uh, there was general consternation. Nobody really knew what, uh, what to expect. Um, and it all, it all unfolded very quickly. Um, I know we were actually in, in Mozambique at, at that time, I think. Um, and I know you were, you, you were either in Mozambique or nearby uh, when it became clearer and clearer that uh, the Portuguese were probably going to be withdrawing. And in a way, it was um, a worst case scenario unfolding. But just tell us about what you remember during that, that period of time, where you were and what was going on. Certainly, Anis. I can't remember where the call came from, but in support commander, um, we were uh, more to trained, although I wasn't. The Portuguese had a, a little town called Zumba, which is where the Luanga River comes into the Zambezi, where Zambia and uh, Mozambique and Rhodesia meet. They had the administrators camped there, and there was a, a Portuguese detachment there, and they were frightened they were going to get taken out by Frelimo. So they obviously called for help. So there was a company of RAR, and I don't recall what company it was, and there was um, support commander with our mortars. And we had sergeants like Mike Kerr, Jim Balaam, and a chap, Vancey Myers, who were all good mortarmen. And so we were flown in. I remember we flew in in those awful decks with those seats made out of straps. We, at that stage, we weren't paratrained, but I remember a guy had his fist under the little back jockey wheel. And I said, but what are you doing? He said, no, they load that deck with bombs until the little wheel nearly touches the fuselage. Anyway, we, we flew into Mozambique, landed there. And as we arrived, the Portuguese soldiers all went to play football. They must have thought, you know, we've arrived, they're safe. Anyway, RLI, I always like to work with the RAR because when we had to dig trenches to dig in, the RAR soldiers dig much better than, than our troopies did. So the RAR helped us do our defenses. And Anas, you won't believe it, but four o'clock in the afternoon, a troopie arrived with a China teacup to give his one pip lieutenant tea in the bush. That poor soldier carried that that China teacup all the way from Rhodesia into Mozambique to give the Isha um, his tea at four o'clock. That impressed me because my troopies never gave me anything. Anyway, um, what happened is the Portuguese camp was in a, not a, in a good order. They had open pit latrines near the kitchen and things like that. And there, was, there, there were no fresh rations for us. And we had a new commander, commander, he was Coke's Morgan Davies. And he said we needed fresh meat. And I knew the member in charge uh, by the name of Paul Bloor, an ex-Prince Edward boy, and I think it was Kenyemba, guide me if, if our town nearest there is Kenyemba. I think he was IC at Kenyemba. And I said, couldn't he help us with some fresh meat? It wasn't an hour later, uh, a helicopter arrives with a body bag underneath with a kudu bullion, which they dropped right near the kitchen for us, which was much appreciated. 
But the story I really want to tell you, our Saab Major there was a Saab Major Pretorius. And uh, he wanted fresh fish. And someone decided that as I came from a family that all swam for Rhodesia, I'd go with them. And they gave us a Zodiac. I don't know if you know those inflatable boats the Portuguese had. It's a, a blow-up boat. And there was one Portuguese guy to drive it. He had a beret with a tassel down the back. And I think the Saab Major came along with his FM in the boat. And I said, Saab Major, what is that for? He said, that's to shoot the crocodiles before they catch you. But what happens is they took sugar packets from the rations, put plastic in it, put a dead end in the short fuse. They'd go down the, the bank, drop this little handmade bomb in. It would go off and eat. there's a, a fish you'll know it well called a chester. So if Cheshire or Bream came to the surface, I had to catch them and put them in the boat. So that's how serious my war in Mozambique was. But what happened, and you'll be interested in this, there was a, that the Portuguese and Fulima were talking at a place called Nampula. Mm -hmm. And the signal came through to us that our involvement in Mozambique was now an embarrassment because they were coming to terms. You mentioned there being a changeover in the administration in Portugal. And so they, they took us out. But interesting enough, most of the guys flew out. I had to go back in a boat across the Zambezi and they took me in a truck. I think I went all the way to Matoka, but I'm not too sure. But the story I want to tell you is I've been in Mozambique for a while. I've got one t-shirt, one pair of shorts, my clandestine tackies and a kit bag. And I wasn't in loud into our mess because I was improperly dressed. Now, Hannes, where am I going to get kit from in the middle of a war? Anyway, there was a lieutenant, I think he's, it was a lieutenant Bosch, but I looked like Tiki the Clown in his kit. He had to give me a shirt and some some combat longs and some first guns that I could go for a meal. Isn't that classic? <laughs> uh, talking about being back at, um, back at Cranbourne, uh, you did spend quite a bit of time in and out of training troop, obviously as a, uh, as a, as a rookie, but also once you'd been commissioned. Um, and, and two, uh, two characters, personalities that every, every RLI man remembers, uh, Captain Tar and CSM Erasmus. Um, I know you bumped into both of them a few times. Johannes, what happened, I don't know why, but uh, I was probably so bad as a combat soldier, they sent me to training troopers to IC to Robin Tarr. And uh, my first day there was a Friday. And on a Friday at noon, there must have been a quarry across the Cranbourne Road. That road goes to the airport. And they blast there on a Friday at 12 o'clock. So I arrive there, this new boy comes to me, Robin Tarr's right-hand man, and they blast, and I take cover on the stoop. And Moose Erasmus says, Listen, guys, combat officer takes cover when necessary. And isn't that looking after a junior one for blue? Uh, and Titch, there were there were there were the odd um, engagements, for want of a better word, down the road at, at Cockdoor, which was a favourite uh, watering hole for the RLI, and uh, there was the odd disturbance that took place there. To be honest, what happened to us guys that were based at Cranbourne had to do gate duty periodically. And I was on gate duty the one Saturday night, and I got a phone call from a desperate policeman somewhere near the railway station on Railway Avenue, there's a police station. And they were being overrun. I can't remember which commander it was. Let's say it was the lovers, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, I get called to the cock door. I duly arrive. And what had happened is that they'd had a party in the troops' canteen. I think Mrs. Haradish must have given them too many snorts or whatever it was. Wasn't that the lady in charge there, Mrs. Haradish? Something like that. Anyway, the, the lads were given permission to, to go to town. So by the time they got to the Lecoq door, I think they'd had a few beers. Anyway, a fight broke out. And look, if you get a whole commander together, they fight and die together. So a fight in a pub is, is going to be a bit of like a combat situation. You know, the police were called... But the troopies turned over a B car. I think it was an Austin Princess. And they turned over one of those, those Land Rovers with the, the cake grids on the side. But that wasn't what upset the police. They then brought in the dogs. And the RLI troopies took off their jackets, wrapped them around the dogs' heads, kicked the dogs to pieces, and threw them down the stairs. 
So when I got to the police station on Railway Avenue, there were some inside, there were some in vehicles and others being pulled through the bars. And uh, whoever the member in charge there was said to me, Titch, if you take these guys away, there'll be no charges. So they just duly kept attention and they all left. But I remember the next morning back at, uh, at uh, Cranbourne, I don't know who was giving them gears, but they were standing there and a sergeant stepped forward and said, yes, sir, the greatest evening we've ever had. So it was just fun for them. Uh, Titch, um, from the RLI, you ended up having a crack at the SAS. Um, you went on selection. Just uh, tell us a bit about that process, how you, how you ended up on selection. Yes. The SAS was losing good men, I think, to the scouts and that. And so our training major at Forara was a friend of mine, Garth Barrett. And he said to a few of us, wouldn't we like to try? So I thought, well, this would be uh, something that I might be able to achieve. So I did a bit of fitness training and we got on a, a train to the Guai River. The, I think they used the Guai River Hotel was the place. But anyway, there was Jungle Jordan. That's John Jordan, myself. There was a, a, a Guthrie, who was the city engineer. There was a, 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 a Brian Hilton, a Copen Barber. But there were bombs and Americans. There were lots of funny people on that train. Now, on the train to the Guai River, I was really cautious because I've been pushed around before. So I didn't drink on the train, but some of the boys had some drinks on the train and they were full of the beans. But when we got to the station at the Guai River, we were assembled up there and I just had a little backpack. That's all I had, a little backpack and a bush hat. But some guys had, there was one guy had a, a metal trunk. It looked like those things we had at the bottom of our beds in boarding school, but I don't know whose it was. Anyway, we lined up and then the, the instructors searched this kit. And they found chips and cool drinks and things. And then they said, so whose is this? Now I could see we all gonna get punished. So as a typical head boy kind of chap, I stepped forward and said, the Coke was mine. I could see the instructor look at me and say, you silly ass. He knew it wasn't mine because I only had a tiny little backpack that could only, it couldn't carry anything. Anyway, so all he made me do was pour it into the ground, but it didn't worry me because it wasn't my Coke. But Hannes, how I got back is we had to do duty at night in that camp at the Guayra River. And look, by the night, we were usually quite thirsty. So I went into the officer's mess when I was on guard and pinched two cokes and put them in the cistern in the officer's mess, that thing behind the toilet. And then periodically when I was stretching, because you're so stiff from the, the hard work I had to give you, I'd go and drink the officer's coke out the toilet, which I thought was a sort of a, a get back at them type of thing. Okay, so then we had to get, get back from Guayra River. They said get to Bulawa, which... There were capable people. We got to Bulawayo, no problem. In Bulawayo, they said we must get to Salisbury. Bob Guthrie was the city engineer, and I'm Charlie, and he had lots of money and lots of connections. So he got us first-class passes with bedding to Salisbury. My parents fetched us at the station. We went to my house for a good breakfast. And then they gave us a task. Obviously, they must give us a task. Our task was to do a Ricky on the Encoma magazine which is where all the ammo is kept and the people that guard it are African troops. But anyway, now on the, on the exercise, I was given the job of taking that T-54 radio to make comms. They didn't send me on the sneak sneak. Anyway, we did the thing. I stopped at the drop off point, reported back to Cranbourne that the guys were here and they're going forward. But anyway, I don't know what happened on the sneak sneak, but suddenly there's rounds being fired live rounds. So the boys that are doing the sneak sneak come back on their A-54s and say, touch, we're under fire. Give us a help here. So I just, I'd try to get back to Cranbourne to ops thing, but because it's an exercise, they turned that net off. It's not necessary now, so they turned it off. So I couldn't get the troops to stop firing live rounds at my mates that are going through the fence, obviously making a lot of noise. Anyway, that was fine. All withdrew, and but the next day, I saw Brian Robson, who I know, um, who I did know before that, and I happened to tell him that I thought if we're going to have an exercise, they shouldn't close down my rear net. 
And he told me, if I as a territorial captain for Rakutile SS had to run their business, then I better go back to my unit. I said, but sir, I, I don't want to go back to my unit. He said, but you're going. But I must, so I got chucked off. And I hadn't, I hadn't sweated yet. Okay, at the Gwai River we ran a bit, you know, they, they say, uh, you're a captain, would you like a couple more rocks, sir? <laughs> you carry a few more rocks than the other guys. So I got chucked off before I even got tested. But the worst part, I had to then go back to the, the stores and hand in my water bottle and whatever else I had. And one of the troopies there said to me, oh, uh, Sir Titch, have you had enough already? Can't you take it? Man, I was embarrassed because it was my mouth that was the problem, not my body or my mind. Uh, yeah. Titch, um, on a, you being a teacher, a lot of the teachers were involved they were doing their stuff in, in police reserve. Um, and you interacted with, with some of those guys who were doing their call-ups as, as uh, police reservists. And um, any um, um, Tali boys will remember Mike Griffiths, uh, and Colin Green and those guys. I think they were, yes. they, they were all doing their stuff uh, with, with, the, with the police. That's quite right. I, I, I'm pleased to say that Everyone did their bit in those. Teachers in their holidays didn't go to the army. They were in the police reserve and they did escort duty and they ran uh, the relay stations, the radio stations. And uh, I, I remember seeing that there was a chap, Monty Erasmus was the headmaster at Oil Boys where I went to school and I was climbing up Birchliff Bridge one day to scratch my initials at the top of the curve where the Sabi River goes underneath Birchliff Bridge. And he had the audacity to tell me that he didn't think an officer should be climbing up the bridge in the middle of the war. So I had to explain to him that he, I outranked him and I always wanted to put my name on the top of the curve of Birchen of Bridge. And those rivets are so big you can climb up quite easy. But that's not the story I want to tell you. At Grand Reef, I get a, a radio call from a call sign I don't know. And apparently there was a relay station somewhere near Buhera. And Mike Griffiths, who you will know from Mtali Boys, was a great cricket coach and a great character, and Colin Green, also Mtali Boys, who later coached Deja Rugby, they were on radio duty there. And they had a request to me, could they have permission to shoot um, a cow or cattle that were being driven up there, Gomo, to check on their position by the Majibas? And look, I, I think... They could be shot, but it wasn't my area. So I said, yeah, go ahead and shoot one. As I said that, Mike Griffiths comes up and says, send salt and pepper. They had already shot this thing. They thought they're in trouble. They were using me to cover them. But Hannes, what happened? We used to have a fixed wing aircraft that flew down that area with resupply or whatever. So we dropped off a packet of salt and pepper, but they didn't have the right knives and there was too much meat, so it went bad there anyway. But it just shows the, shows the spirit of the fighting men. Yeah, it, cert it certainly does. Titch, um, just any other stories that come to mind about the farming, the farming guys that you interacted with, um, played rugby with, um, and just what they were actually going through. Uh, they all made light of it, but it was a, it was a very, very difficult time for these chaps. Hannes, I farmed at Premier Estates under um, former our major Rob Truscott, and our neighbour was the Franklins. They had a big dairy farm just at the Nyanga Turnoff. And uh, I'd only just got to the farm and I didn't yet know how to work my agri-alert alert correctly. And round about, uh, must have been about two in the morning, there was all sorts of firing coming from the Franklins farm and there's messages going backwards and forwards, but I was going to shoot bush pig the next day and I had to get up early, so I turned my radio off. I was going down the, uh, it's the Amtali River with a pack of dogs and my shotgun and this hunter who had a spear and I came across tracks of about 20 people. They'd been at the Franklin's farm, they'd culled his cattle and they were leaving. I'm just glad that I didn't go sooner because I would have bumped into them. But to give you a typical story of the farmers, this is the story that comes from a farmer's wife and she said that She'd been to the village to buy something. She'd been looking after screaming children and running the farm, paying wages or whatever. Husband's away for six weeks. And when she got back from the village, the houseboy said to Madam, 
uh, Isha was here. And she said, but why was Isha here? She said, no, she thought he'd been wounded or there's some tragedy. She said, no, he came home to fetch his fast racket and his fishing rod. So obviously this farmer was at a place in the priest's reserve that wasn't fighting for their lives. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Titch, on a more serious note, um, the uh, and you particularly being involved in rugby and sport as a sports master and stuff, um, just talk about some of the youngsters you knew uh, who were very promising sportsmen who um, lost their lives in the war. Um, I, there were a lot of them from Abtali, but um, I just some of the names that might uh, spring to mind that uh, you happy to talk about. And as that's the tragedy of war, that the best, because they're usually leaders and fearless, they, they seem to go first. And uh, a few names come to mind. I start with a chap, John Barry. They found the Rudzi. There were a lot of Barrys in that Miniclan area, but John was head prefect in my hostel. And uh, um, I had to go to a cafe in Main Street to buy a ginger ale for my mother-in-law, she wanted a brand in Israel. And when I got there, playing mini soccer was John Barry, perfectly dressed with his basher on and a fag hanging out his mouth. So he had to meet me later. But he played Rhodesian under 20 rugby. Uh, he Then he went to do his national service and he made SS, he's in the SS. Now I think he'd finished his tour of duty and he was due to go to university to study further. And uh, he got involved in in some incidents and he was killed there and it's such a waste of a young man because i think he just went to try and raise some pocket money before he went to university there was another youngster peter bow who was an 800 meter runner trained by a coach called mick pfeiffer who's probably the brightest athletic prospect rhodesia had at the time and he he i think he went off to the virginia area or somewhere there to farm uh, he, his folks came from Rasapi, I think, but he went to his own farm to farm there and the farm attack, he got killed. Um, there was another young chap, Mark Langerman, who was a lieutenant, also an outstanding sportsman. He uh, went on that same SAS course with me. He got killed in action, just doing what he's trained to do. And the other one was, there was a family that lived just uh, at the base of Christmas Pass, the Whitfields. Yes. And uh, I think there were two brothers. Was he John Whitfield? Pete. Both big boys, Pete and John. Both big, strong boys, yeah. And one of those youngsters, also outstanding rugby, played, played junior provincial, could have, like John, could have made it to the highest level. They also lost their lives. What do we sacrifice? Yes. At, at, the, at the School of Infantry, the cadet officers have to do uh, night maneuvers and things. And on this particular occasion, they gave us some, R I think they were RAR recruits, but they're young African soldiers. They weren't yet complete. Now, I wasn't in charge of the platoon at this stage. I just walked me along. But as you know, with Rhodesian rivers in winter, you would have a little stream and then there'd be a pool and then another stream, and then another pool. And we had to, um, in extended order, go through this little stream. And we duly got through freezing cold. It was in the Saluki Hills. Uh, where I saw a herd of Tessabee for the first, no, roan antelope for the first time in my life. But we went through and we just were bedding down for the night and African Star Major came up to speak to me. And when he called me Mambo and Isha, I thought, where well, is something wrong? Because an African Star Major in the RAR would never call a cadet officer uh, anything else. Anyway, he said, could I please help him? His nephew that was on the course had lost his rifle when we came through the river. And if he arrived at the end of the exercise and no rifle, he would never get into the RAR. So I said, yeah, I'm quite prepared to help him, but I don't know where to go. And he said, no, the youngster would take me there. And this youngster, how he got back there, I don't know, because I didn't know where I was. He took us back, they had to strip off in that cold Midlands winter and dive into this river, but I found his rifle and uh, he he really gladly took it and we went back. And when I got back to my place, that Sergeant Major gave me a Coca-Cola. So that was how grateful he was. And on an exercise like that, a Coca-Cola is a great gift. No, that, I think that's about all I've got for you, Hannes. Well, it's been super talking to you, Titch. Um, really thanks for your time and your recollections. Uh, just uh, a lot of great stories. And I just think it um, you, you help people understand uh, the sort of the nature of the people 
that were in, that were involved there and um, how, yep. how people dealt with adversity uh, in, in such a special way. And it's just as a footnote, I'm not on Facebook, but there were many Facebook messages that came through of people that said they liked to hear another aspect of the war. But people must remember it was it was a war. It wasn't a, a Sunday school picnic. But it's good to think, for instance, there was one chap, Vince Zorik, who was at Grand Reef Airport in instant, I mentioned last time, and he said that if they weren't there, we would have been overrun. And that's nice to get that feedback. Thanks for your time, Titch. Thank you, Hannes. Cheers.